In a world where technology is now blamed for increased isolation, polarization and disconnection, is it reasonable to argue that tech could also be the solution? That's the idea behind consciousness hacking. I think when people speak about consciousness hacking, they think of it as the tools and strategies by which humans can uh, alter their own experience. Because there's a lot more awareness now of the dangers of technology. People are starting to realise the effect that social media and mobile phones are having on our attention spans. And But you're sort of taking a much more utopian view than that. You actually think that technology can be the solution as well as the problem. Maybe let's outline what we think the problem is first before we... Can. Sure, so I, 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 wouldn't ha I don't have a utopian view. I'd consider myself a techno-realist, not not, and, and somewhere between a techno-realist and a techno-optimist, um, contingent upon certain conditions changing. Our current predicament is uh, nothing less than uh, disastrous in terms of how we're interacting with our technologies. Like I was in, even in the train, the, the tube over here today, and uh, I looked around me and it was this, this dystopian... Uh, I just this, this this dystopian sense because I was on my left was Candy Crush in front of me was someone else playing Candy Crush and my right was Candy Crush, and um, what we we have to understand is that technology has been designed to hack our dopamine feedback loop response, and as Tristan Harris says, it's a kind of a race to the bottom of the brainstem, and we're people are people are engaging in these swipes in order to elicit some sort of neurological response without really knowing why they're doing what they're doing. And um, this is uh, not the way technology has to go. I think, if, if anything, this is antithetical to the deeper human experience, that uh, we're, we're uh, manipulating very basic human uh, vulnerabilities and using it in order to basically sell more stuff. Uh, and, but, but the other thing is if you look at on a train, for example, um, I think what a lot of people are using technology for is essentially to, to move out from their present experience. That an uncomfortable sensation may arise in the body and now we, don't know, we no longer have to sit with it. Instead we can distract and get that dopamine hit. And uh, that is very, very problematic, both from a spiritual perspective in terms of being able to really um, be okay with what is, but also from a, a societal perspective, we are take our current technological landscape is creating uh, fragile humans and essentially traumatized ones. We're looking for these addictive dopamine loops because we can't handle what, what is. It's almost like we're turning into different kinds of creatures. What does a human being look like without an attention span? What does a human being look like if they're constantly distracted all the time? That's a kind of a mass experiment that's going on yeah, at the we, moment. We build our tools and then our tool, we create our tools and then our tools create us. Uh, yeah, I mean, ADD and, and, and concentration difficulties are, are, are ubiquitous now. And it's because we're training our brains to respond to higher and higher levels of audio and visual stimulation. Uh, so then now no longer is a book sufficiently adequate for the brain and body to be uh, satisfied with. We need more and more. It's, it's addiction. It's the same uh, mechanics of addiction that we see with drugs, we're seeing with tech. We need more of a stimulus to create the same response. This is, uh, this is and so when I speak about the, the benefits of technology, I want to um, emphasize the way it currently is, is not the thing. It feels like there's quite a lot of branching off points here. I mean, the one, the one thing that I'm really struck by is Daniel Schmachtenberger talks about this, that addiction is the most, um, the, the most profitable form of capitalism or the most profitable form of relationship between any business and its client if you can get your customer addicted to something. So I know we'd like to kind of unpack it and maybe talk about how technology might be used in another way, but isn't the deeper question how in an in inherently exploitative dynamic how can you move away from that because all of the incentives are leading in the other direction? Yeah. No, it's a massive question and I think the question is can we build non -a -a competitive, as in when I use the word competitive I mean um, uh, successful uh, non-addictive tools in a capitalist system? Because ultimately um, 
our, because of our, especially with the mobile phone software, our profit models are based on ad revenue, and ad revenue is contingent upon how much time the user is spent on screen. Obviously, if you're a company and you're looking to maximize shareholder value, as is in your duty and profit maximization, and you can choose to, to have your, your consumers in a screen for 10 seconds versus five seconds, you're gonna choose the former. It's, it's built into the economics. And this uh, attention economy, as Tristan in the Center for Human Technology speak to, um, this is uh, extremely distorting. And so I think, it re I think uh, ultimately what a new paradigm of technology has to look like is some sort of juxtaposition of a new tool with a new system that doesn't just reward um, the, in which addiction isn't the inevitable emergent outcome. So, and I'm interested to, to hear you talk a bit more about those technologies, sort of the technological side of things before maybe we sort of swing back round to um, whether that's even possible to, to shift wholesale towards that within uh, what you might call a game A or a kind of rivalrous um, capitalist economy. Yeah. Uh, one, th one thing I want to say, a big emphasis of consciousness hacking is not really, is, is, is not just what are we building, but really where are we building from? And we have to understand that uh, the things that we build and that which we create are expressions and extensions of us. That we are building tools that addict and uh, tools that harm because our consciousness is informing that creation process. We're creating um, systematizing and um, uh, abstract things that are disconnected from the heart because we're building from a certain level of rationality, abstraction and logic. I think a big part of this consciousness hacking movement is what would exponential creation look like if it were built from the heart? And to say that differently, if we do not start to build from a more integrated place and we continue to have many, you know, 25 year old programmers with exponential capacities at their hands, that's catastrophic, like that is not a good thing. Um, we need to build our tools from a deeper place, a place of wisdom. And I think what you feel and what a lot of us feel is that our tech process is so out of alignment with deeper wisdom, life's natural flow, uh, that has to shift. But for that to shift, we need a full reorientation for what tech is all about. Is it about extracting from the ground in a linear way that isn't circular? No. Is it about addicting people? No. Is it about causing exponential species level harm? No. Um, it's out of alignment with the deeper impulse of life. And I think we all feel that. I think a lot of people have this resistance to technology and it's a very intuitive resistance. It's plastic. It's, it's, it's not sustainable. Uh, we need to be careful as to what we are actually scaling. And a big part of what we focus on is, let's build from deeper and deeper places of consciousness. I'd love to get a few examples. I've, I've, I've heard you talk about this before, so I'd love to get some of the examples of how tech could be used in a different way or, it, or is being used in a different way. Yeah, so I spoke just, just there to, to the inputs into tech, like where are we building from? And then we also have to ask, what, what are we actually building, so the tools. Uh, what we're interested in is, how do we make technology actually nourishing to the human being? Let's say tech is on a scale of uh, minus 10 to plus 10, minus 10 being it does utmost harm, plus 10 saying it does like the utmost good. A lot of our tech is probably at the level of maybe minus three or minus four to the human experience. A lot of people are calling for tech to be at a zero. It's ethical, it's neutral. What we're saying is, what would it look like if tech actually brought us closer together? It deepened our human experience, and helped rather than hindered our emotional, psychological, and spiritual development. And so for example, you have version 1.0 of a consciousness hacking technology would be something like biofeedback for meditation. You wear a brain, a headband like the Muse, it gives you audio signals as to whether or not you're in a meditative state or not. It augments and encourages the meditation process and you can actually massively uh, 
improve performance it's probably the wrong word to use for meditation but um make the the the, the learning loop more effective so there's biofeedback tools there's even headspace or waking up on your phone as a meditation tech but that's all just like version 1.0 of what's out there and this is often called transformative technologies version 2 there's some really uh, more advanced stuff coming out right now. So for example, uh, you've heard me speak before about um, ultrasonic neuromodulation, which is ultrasound to the brain, which uh, Jay Sanguinetti and Shenzhen Young, the meditation teacher is Shenzhen, and Jay is a researcher, researcher at the University of Arizona, um, have showed that isolating some very small ultrasound waves to a very specific part of the brain can lead to massive reductions in internal narrative and self-rumination. So the question is, you know, if people are, one in four people in the UK have a mental health disorder at any one time, what if they had access to tools that could help to calm down their nervous systems, heal from their trauma? This stuff is actually beginning to emerge. That's on the mental health side of things, uh, but then you also look at the more systemic impacts. So for example, the climate change narrative is failing right now because reason and science doesn't seem to be getting through in terms of a policy and I think a large part of that is because ideas um, operate at one level but experience kind of deepens into another and so uh, some studies have come out that show that seeing a coral reef or one study in particular seeing a coral reef um, decimate in virtual reality in one experience leads to the user actually having a marked reduction in things like energy consumption, increase in recycling, months and months down the line from that single experience. You can use the same VR for empathy, things like that. So there are tools out there that we can say, okay, what if we actually harness this power for deeper and deeper levels, higher states and higher stages of consciousness? Uh, it's possible and it's happening. Um, and the different framing of that would be, well, what if, if we don't do that? Uh, we're, we're just building tools that are amplifying some of the, uh, the most basic human tendencies and pathologies. Yeah, I mean, in my more positive moments, I can kind of think, okay, we've got, we have the first wave of tech and Facebook, Twitter, they're reinforcing all of our sort of worst aspects, our narcissistic biases, our desire to be seen, our desire to be validated, um, and also optimizing for outrage and for limbic hijack to keep us on site. I mean, all of these things sort of, and in my more optimistic moments, I can say, well, that's not built into the tech. The, it could be possible, for example, to have a social media site based around um, what we know about people's growth patterns. Like, how do you become more open-minded? How do you see more people's perspectives? How do you encounter views that challenge what you think and lead you to a more developed perspective on etc etc? All of these things could be possible or designing it around um, yeah a, a trajectory of growth individualized for an individual person. That for example could be possible but then we run into the difficulty of thinking but the reason that these platforms are optimized for this is because that is what's rewarded. Attention is rewarded. Outrage is, is, makes for a sticky site that means that people are interacting with it. And it seems difficult to see how anything oriented towards a more holistic vision, for want of a better word, would be able to compete in a marketplace with, with a world that's oriented around stickiness and outrage and those features. No, I agree. It's, it's very, very tough. To, to imagine this, given the economic incentives that would uh, suggest we are inevitably going somewhere else. Um, but tech is, look, tech is an amplifier. It amplifies scale and amplifies its potency. And where I've come to with this argument is really my big interest is in consciousness. My, my interest is more in the consciousness piece, I think, than the actual tech piece. But I came to the conclusion that the problems of the world are essentially problems of human consciousness, a certain level of development and a certain state of mind. And uh, things like psychedelics, meditation retreats, lucid dreaming, a lot of these interventions cannot uh, scale very effectively for legal, social, religious, time uh, limitation reasons. 
Uh, tech has this exponential capacity to scale. It's also abundant as 3D printing comes more and more in into to fashion. Uh, and so the, the, the question is, is, we have this capacity to scale tech. And if we were to reorient that towards uh, human flourishing, then what kind of world would we create? And really, it's not going to be easy. And yet at the same time, tech companies work in hierarchies. And me living out in San Francisco in the Bay Area, I really see hope in that a lot of the people with their fingers on power at these companies are to some degree waking up to a deepening of the importance of a holistic approach. So I think if there is sufficient uh, momentum and drive from these leaders, I think we can start to create a change. Um, I think it has to be juxtaposed with, I think like you rightly say, some sort of incentives change. Let me, let me say it th this differently. This, I think the merging of technology and higher human consciousness is potentially the most important synergy of the 21st century. Technology has this amplification capacity of exponentiality, of scale, of power. Um, so we're going to be amplifying something. If we don't amplify, if we amplify these base human tendencies of greed, of anger, of hatred, we're in trouble. If we amplify love, compassion, connection, higher states of human consciousness, that's a different game altogether. Uh, and I think we can. I agree with the first bit. I'm more skeptical about the second bit, the I think we can. Why do you think we can? I think we can for a number of reasons. The first is people think psychedelics can change the world, right? We've met those people. Um, and meditation, people think, can really change some deep substructures of the world. I think when we start to understand more about nanotechnology and hardware and software, we're going to view psychedelics and meditation as pretty blunt instruments vis-a-vis -vis what technology might have the capacity to do. Um, stuff is happening in that trajectory. AI, um, the, the people are creating, uh, the, Dr. Julian Mossbridge from uh, Northeastern University is creating, uh, injecting or at least attempting to inject unconditional love into artificial intelligence. It's a project. Um, that's taking, you know, this really interesting project. Um, and that's not to say their AI will necessarily feel love, but can it actually uh, be a mirror for humans by which the human feels completely accepted in all that they are? Uh, the things that are coming out, ultrasonic neuromodulation, loving AI, uh, there, is just a, there is a host of tools that people are getting wind of and are merging. Uh, Jamie Wheel, you know, stealing fire went viral in large part because of this idea of enlightenment engineering. Uh, it's not a perfect solution. So, for example, as these tools come out in which we, we draw humans to higher levels of consciousness, someone might create a bliss button, you know, an enlightenment button, you know, state change on demand. That causes all sorts of ethical issues. The flip side of that, what if we created tools that actually showed us our shadow, that actually were able to to encourage us into more and more discomfort. It's not all asymmetric. Like, uh, and these are deep, deep discussions that are being had right in the heart of Silicon Valley as we speak. So, part of my pushback against Silicon Valley is the techno-utopian piece that we can just innovate our way out of anything and everything. I think that itself is pathological. Um, at the same time, I don't think we've fully understood uh, the real potential that tech can be in service to. There was a, a line in, I did an interview with Douglas Rushkoff recently, and there was a line, he was talking about the, the um, psychedelic history of Silicon Valley and how deeply entwined it was with, with tech. He said something like Silicon Valley dropped acid and now everyone's having a bad trip. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a, um, a, some psychedelic residue in yeah, and the way that Silicon Valley operates, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm really fascinated by the dynamics of Silicon Valley and also this sort of weightlessness. It's almost like um, the operating system that we had before became weightless with, with, um, with the digital world and kind of exponential tech that suddenly you just had 
And that, that sort of feels very like the psychedelic experience as well. This almost like grandiosity of it and the, the kind of potentiality of it. It's like, we can take over the world. And it's like, well, suddenly we've created these tools where yeah. we can take over the world. But to use, to use Jimmy Wheel's expression, yeah. a lot of the, the world of tech is ecstasis and insufficient catharsis. It's the transcendent over the imminent. Yeah. It's this almost a, a, a bypassing the human condition rather than a deep embodiment of it. Tech is an amplifier of what we are. In the same way that um, psychedelics are a non-specific amplifier. Precisely. Yeah. The only thing with tech is, my argument is they could be probably more, actually more specific amplifiers. Um, the, the question here, and here is, man, how do we get healing, awakening, developing? If you use uh, Ken Wilber's model, wake up, clean up, grow up, show up, how can tech be in service of waking up to subtler levels of reality? How can tech be in service of growing up from eth ego and ethnocentric stages of development to world-centric stages of development? How can tech be in service of, of healing? And how can tech be in service of... Um, deeper levels of interconnection and uh, when, when I say how can it be in service the flip side again is what if it's not what if exponential potencies are not in service of those things well you saw the Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, drone strikes did you see that the, the, Saudi, the Saudi oil facilities 50% of Saudi Arabia oil facilities wiped out in a single day from, from, half, from, from a dozen drones we have Exponential capacities that are being disseminated and decentralized. Uh, all it takes, as Daniel Schwachsenberger speaks to this, is one or two non-state actors to use that capacity of robotics like drones, synthetic biology, cyber terrorism malevolently, and then you have global catastrophic risk potentialities. The, these things are all being built, and as of course, to go back to duality as a, as, a, as, a, as a balancing act, I think, as we increase our capacity to do harm through tech, we also increase our capacity to do good. And consciousness hacking speaks on this side of the movement that says, hey, this way, yeah. What gives you confidence that it's possible for us to choose the, the positive path rather than the negative path that we seem to be on at the moment? Or is it more of a hope? Both. A couple of things. A lot of the people who I've had the opportunity to come into contact with in San Francisco are people who have been very successful at, say, gamey. And there's liquidity going this way. And there is also just a deep human need that eventually we woke up to the fact that cigarettes were bad for us and that stuff, stuff had to change. And I think at the same time, you know, in su to some degree, demand does create supply. Um, so I think there's this combination of people who are at the top of this so-called tech hierarchy, in my experience, waking up, waking up to the uh, necessity for this shift, and the inevitable rise in people saying, hey, like, this ain't good enough. I'm addicted. I I'm addicted. Um, yeah, I, I emphasize this point, this merging of the, the techno-mystic, I think, is going to be a very key part of this transition to game B. But we need a holistic reframing of every single part from the design process to the output process. Yeah. I mean, you talked you talk before about kind of the idea of maybe a, a button that gave you a kind of peak state and the dangers of that. So, and a lot of... Like traditional spirituality or traditional meditation practice has all been about kind of the hard, the hard work of getting there and sustaining. And, and is there a danger that the, all of these sort of technological solutions are just shortcuts? Yeah, and some people say there are the, the crutches that will become reliant upon. Um, so I think if we imagine technology to be something akin to a tool that is currently used in meditation, for example, focusing on the breath, it's a tool that we're using as an object, which is eventually meant to be let go of. I think the same with technology is, can we use technology as a tool that um, serves a certain purpose along one's own developmental path, and then when you're ready, you can let go. 
Uh, so I think that's why it's really like the skillful means. We, we did this conference, Awakened Futures, and Mikey Siegel, who founded Consciousness Hacking, you know, really was asking, what are the skillful means of the future? Or to say it a different way, like how good can we get at really shifting human consciousness at a personalized level? So that, that's the first bit I'd say. The second bit is, uh, inevitably, there are going to be unintended consequences of benevolent and nourishing technology. For example, people might become addicted to the high and then we'll need clinics to heal that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't go forward. It's we have to do a very like serious cost benefit analysis and say, hey, there are a lot of potentialities and a lot of potential pitfalls. Um, and the other thing, and I, I spoke to this slightly earlier, uh, this uh, hedonic treadmill that we're on of blissing out, we'll, if we build technology that way, not a good thing. If we build our tools that basically de allow us to deepen into our own experience, which by necessity is the whole, uh, the, 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 the plethora of human experience from negative to positive, that's a, different, uh, that's a different innovation altogether. So these can be shortcuts if they're designed in the wrong way. There could be some sort of non-dual transcendent function button. That's not what we're calling for here. It's how do we align our technology from a place of wisdom and in order to enhance wisdom. And wisdom is not hedonism. I hope you're right. <laughs> you're skeptical. Still, I'll convince you one day, Fuller. Yeah. What do you make of it? <laughs> Vote below. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.